Welcome to Convicted Hearts. I am Jen, your host, and today I have the pleasure of being here with April. April, I am so excited to be here with you and talk about your life experience and the journey you've been on. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate you. Yeah, we were introduced uh, by a good friend, Karen. So shout out to Karen. Um, yes. She's been a real inspiration, and I hear your story is very inspiring as well. I'd like to start out with, you know, hearing a little bit about maybe where you're from and what things were like when you were growing up. Okay. Uh, as you know, my name is April Atkins. Um, I was raised, born and raised in Compton, California. Um, I was a good kid, man. I was, uh, I used to watch uh, the Brady Bunch all the time. And I kind of wanted my life to line up like Cindy Brady in a sense. Okay. You know, uh, with, even though I didn't have a father in a home or anything, but I just felt like um, I felt like I was a good kid like her, you know, and, and I deserved some, something, you know, that life like that, like her birthday parties and stuff like that. You know, yeah. um, my life devastatingly changed uh, mm -hmm. when I was 12. I was raped by a neighborhood boy mm -hmm. and um, I was 12. He was 15. But I was I was pretty small for my my age and uh and he was rather bigger than me and he threw me down on the ground and and i was well let me back up just a little bit my sister was cooking dinner and told me to go to the store to go get some kool-aid and where i lived at on my street um one side of the street was lined up with houses the other side was lined up with apartments so we would cut through the apartment building cut across the alley parking lot, go to the store. So I had went to the store successfully. When I came back, he was behind the apartment building and called me over. I knew who he was, so I went. And when I went, that's when, you know, he uh, he basically attacked me, you know, um, not where he was socking me or anything, but he, he, he manhandled me, I'll say, you know. Yeah. And um, he was, um, he raped me and he um, was trying to get me to have oral sex with him. And I kept saying, well, let me go take this Kool-Aid home. And because I have a big family, I have five brothers and three sisters. I said, before one of them come looking for me, let me go take this home first. He was like, all right, you better come back. And when I got up to walk away in my mind, I felt victorious because I was able to con him to go home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's crazy. I went home and I walked in the door and I told my sister, I said, hey, uh, Anthony just raped me. And she was, I mean, no, I said, Anthony just did the nasty to me. Mm -hmm. And she was like, what? So she called my mom at that particular time. My mom was working at the hospital. She called my mom and I don't know who called the police, but the police came. The ambulance and they took me to the police station. I mean, took me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, they did the whole CSI, like you see on TV. They did the whole thing, and then um, they took me to the to the police department. And uh, you know, this is a major part of of my story right here. I always said they gave me pizza and Pepsi in that room after they got the rape kid in a scene that they could arrest somebody by what happened to me. So they fed me to comfort me mm -hmm. and told me I was gonna be okay. Cause they put a lineup of the pictures, these kids pictures, and I pointed at who it was. And they were like, you're gonna be okay. You wanna be okay. You want something else? You want another piece of pizza? Mm -hmm. And I don't even recall my answer. I just know I kind of checked out, you know? Yeah. So I went home that day and no one ever asked me was I okay after that. Not one person in my whole entire life ever asked me was I okay. Not the police, you know, and I don't blame my family. I think my family wanted me to still, uh, wanted to leave that conversation to me without being uncomfortable, you know? And uh, 
no one, and I never fought them. And until I got older, I didn't even fought the police because I did not really recognize the, the gravity of what their positions were, was to protect and serve. Mm-hmm. They didn't protect me and they didn't serve me. In that same police department started violating me right after that. Um, meaning uh, I was left to defend that little girl. Yeah. I was I was left to defend April. So what I did, I told her without a word, hey, you're gonna go in this closet. I got you. I'm Bo Peep. I'm about to take over. I got us. Don't worry about it. And so I shut her in this closet and I became Bo Peep. And with the most toxic masculinity traits that I could possibly get because I was no longer ever going to be seen as prey or taken advantage of. I mean, I can imagine as a child that young, the trauma alone, um, I can't even imagine it, but you go into sort of like a self-preservation mode. And uh, yes. it's, uh, was it like an alter ego almost that you took on? Uh, yeah, without without knowing so. We're talking a 12-year-old kid. I didn't know what the outcome. Only thing I knew was, as I'm going to put you in my 12-year-old state of mind. Okay. Dang, if they find out that this happened, somebody else going to try to do that to me. Yeah. You know, so I have to be tough. So right. don't cry. Mm-hmm. Leave that. You know, that's what it was. All right, let's let's... Let's uh, adopt the life of the ones who lived across the street. Because in my house, we served God. We went to church. Mm -hmm. That means that don't work because when I was over there doing that, that's how he caught me slipping because I was too, I was too humble. And I came when you called me, you know? And when I came, I didn't have anything to defend myself. So that's when I became the person that I had became. Uh, so. Yeah. How do you feel like that altered your life going, you know, moving forward from that? What, what sort of things took place that? Oh, really- uh, you know, um, I, I, my life devastatingly changed. Um, I became, I was a gang member. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was the first female gang member in my whole, the whole gang that I was part of, um, I um, started, uh, excuse me? In Compton where you're at? Yes. Um, I I started carrying weapons. I I, uh, smoked my first joint at 12. Um, I started doing things that the guys were doing because I needed to be an equal. If not an equal, I needed to be a little bit higher. I needed to have more heart than the guys that I knew. Because the the object of the game was the game of life, I'll say. The object of the game of life that I took it on, you must fear me, you know, and don't F with me ever. Because, you know, I I lost once. I'm not going to lose again. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I started, um, the ones that lived across the street from me, they were the ones that could smoke weed with their uncles and, you know, and all them, we didn't have that over on my side of the street. Mm-hmm. So I became, uh, I adopted, I adopted them as my family, Got you it. know. And I'm sure they took you in with open arms, right? To- Absolutely. Cause I, I, I became, uh, I became, I don't give a fuck. Let's go. That's who I became. No questions asked. Let's go. Because if I said I never needed anybody to question my my street, mm-hmm. I never wanted anybody to question my my heart, my ability to be tough. Mm-hmm. So because I needed that in order to protect myself, I told myself. Right. You know. Yeah, so I could see how that would make you an, an asset, 
you know, definitely because you were ready to go at all times. Yeah. Yeah. Very, I was very much as, as an adult now, as, a, as someone who has, you know, researched my life and started understanding what took place. I was absolutely putting myself in a position to be completely used. Oh, okay. uh, uh, to be destructive, you know, but I didn't see that at first. I just seen that, hey, I fit in now, you know, I, I got pushed down on the ground as a little teenage girl and I stood up damn near a grown ass man yeah. in my mind, in my actions. Yeah, like a defense mechanism, yeah. Yes. What sort of things would you, you know, you would go across the street, you said smoke, kick back. When did things start getting, um, to where you would go out maybe and do things that would end up getting you in trouble. I I, I did things all the time. Like like I fought I fought a whole lot. Okay. Um, I fought a lot. I uh, I hung out. You know, my mom had a, a street curfew, a uh, street light curfew. You know, okay. and uh, you know I I I would do things. I, it was like basically I played two. I was I was I was April at home mm -hmm. and then I was Bo Peep on the streets until I got about mm -hmm. 15, 16, where Bo Peep just went everywhere. Mm -hmm. It was still, I would still be respectful to my mom, you know, to my family, but I still, it was like, um, it was like uh, an hourglass from time to time, he seen a little bit of sand come through. That was the Bo Peep. And I was just, you know, just slowly coming through. Okay. You know, it was like a year, a, a three year hourglass, a little bit, a little bit at a time. But in them three years, I was flooded. I was Bo Peep completely. Wow. You and know, what was your, your mom or your family, I'm sure they were noticing the changes in you. Did anyone, you know, talk to you about it or was it just sort of swept under the rug? It was like um, my mother, my mother worked a lot. My mother was a single parent. It was uh, nine of us. Um, and I'll say they, they, it, it, it was just like, um, you know, kind of growing up, it was like, dang, she bad. Yeah. yeah. Because mind you, no one in the neighborhood knew what happened. No one, like, uh, it's like his family knew, but really no one knew what happened. So I just became, you know, got to the age where they would say back in the day, the old folks would say, you start to smell your own ass. So yeah. it became like, I just started getting bad. You know, I started being this, this bad kid that was still, uh, charming. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, um, my mother always, my mother, somebody did an interview on me when I was locked up and they said I was very charming. My mother said I was very charming. So I know like I've always had where people liked me, like mm -hmm. mothers, grandmothers, people right. at the church, they liked me uh, because I, I knew how to uh, keep street street. But, you know, when I was in the streets, I was in the streets. Does that yeah. make sense? Like, yeah, it does. Uh, it doesn't, yeah. not, not everybody can do that. So that yeah. is, uh, I was, yeah, I, I think I let April, I let April breathe at times when it was safe. Yeah. Anything outside that door of church or my mom, mm -hmm. church or home, it was, it was, it was Bo Peep. As soon as I walked out the front door, school, they got Bo Peep. Mm -hmm. You know, street got Bo Peep. I play softball, they got Bo Peep. You know what I mean? Because I needed to be, uh, I needed to do what the system didn't do. I needed to protect me. And I did it by my examples, mm -hmm. by the only means that I knew, which was the guys in the, on the block, the people that I seen on, on TV that was rough and tough, the people that mess with. Um, you know, when, when my life started changing, when I, when I became Bo Peep, it was like, uh, this is, now we're talking, the, the epidemic is, is about to start. The drugs are mm -hmm. starting to peak, the, the crack and all these things. So I, 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 
bought into that. Have money, have respect. So that'll be another character trait that I could put on myself where people will respect who I am. Mm-hmm. So I started doing that, you know, and being, uh, you know, kind of known for that as well, you know. And so um, the police used to be real heavy, heavy on my block. Now, mind you, even prior to that, I told you I did not fought, really fought the police because I didn't know any better. I just... I didn't even equate the fact that I was supposed to be protected and served until I did many years in prison. Right. I never looked at it like that, you know, but um, I recall uh, a a few times police manhandling me and I have to say, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, I'm a girl. You know, I remember one particular time I had to be about 16 probably 16, 18, somewhere right there. Mm -hmm. And the police, they came up on our block and I tried to go under a car. Mm -hmm. I didn't make it and the police came, ran over there and put his foot on my neck. Mm -hmm. So, and all I'm saying is, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, I'm a girl. You know, and the reason why I, I speak on that because I remember what happened with George Floyd. Yes. We talking 30, 35, 40 years prior to that, my a police officer's foot, not his knee, his foot was on my neck between, I was between the curve and a car. A little kid, young, let me smile. And his foot was on my neck. And he also like during the time we're saying between I'm saying between eight, uh, 15 and 18. Mm-hmm. Police taking me, taking my money from me, dropping me off in different neighborhoods that didn't weigh off somewhere, robbing me, um, robbing different people in my neighborhood, uh, dropping us off in, in rival hoods. And, I heard you know, of this, yeah. We're talking, you know, Jen, I am, I'm, I'll be 59 this year. Mm-hmm. We're talking before cameras, before the p- police brutality situation, you know, even though you had like watch riots and things, you all seen these white officers. We're talking African-American officers, you know, the ones that uh, grew up that went to school with your brothers and sisters that were bullied in school and they came and to me put on the uniform so they can get even. You know, yeah. talking that, you know, mm-hmm. and making my arrest record long, where it's never no disposition or uh, not filed. But every time you put me in handcuffs and you're doing something to violate me, that's what made me say, you know, what the hell, man? Y'all mm-hmm. didn't do all. Only thing you need, needed to do was have a conversation with me coming, come knock on my door and say, it's April here. How are you feeling today? No, but instead you try. You did everything you could to harm me mm-hmm. after somebody else harmed me. So in my life, the police was my second violation. I was violated by the boy and I was violated by the whole system. You know, the district attorney, whoever it was, I was violated twice before I was 18 years old. So there was never any follow up care for you or, you know, checking in on you. Was anything, did anything happen to the boy that, that did that to you? He got, he got five years. He was a juvenile. He, they, they, he got out when he was 21 and I seen him. I was able to see him. Um, We, as a matter of fact, we was, we walked past, he was walking past each other. At that time, I just needed, I had a gun on me as well. I needed him to see that I wasn't scared of him. But I didn't do anything because it's going to sound good. The roughness of me mm-hmm. needed him to see. I'm not scared of you, bro. We can go. The little girl inside of me was saying, come on, let's hurry up. Let's get past him. Yeah. So it was like I was two people walking past him with the strength of keep going. The little girl was nudging me enough to keep going, mm-hmm. you know, fighting the outer one. 
that wanted to just like do something, but I was still scared. Of course, yeah. 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 That, that is crazy. I can't imagine, you know, passing in yeah. the street like that. Um, what is something that you think could have made a difference, you know, in your young life? Do you think if maybe the police would have showed more concern, followed up with you? Um, do you think that could have made a difference? Somebody needed to check on me. Yeah. You know, um, I believe the person today, you know, I'm an abolitionist. Um, today, I believe that we as a community, we, that it's, it's our duty, man. It's our, if you see somebody gaining weight, starting to shut down, mm -hmm. withdraw, um, hanging out later, um, needing all this privacy, the kids needing privacy, um, angry, it's something going on. Right. And, and there are, and I'm quite sure there are people in their lives that have been that that sees see this like teachers, counselors. Kids don't just become bad. We're not just bad. Nobody's nobody just wakes up and say, "Hey, you know what? Let me go freaking burn down this church." Right. Nobody does that. It's a buildup. Mm -hmm. It's 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 food poison. It's food poison. That's the best way you get this. You in, in, ingest this. This, this trauma that becomes poison in your belly mm -hmm. and and you can't get that out. There's nothing there. Nobody's trying to even give you uh, uh, in a uh, not physically. Nobody's trying to give you a Pepto-Bismol. Nobody's trying to give you something to relieve that pain. Mm -hmm. What's happening is when that happens, we go into these places that are steady giving us this rotten stuff to put inside of us and, and before, that. Long, before long you completely you're sick yeah. you become sick and with no relief because no one is even checking your temperature that's the best way i could put it check temperatures that that part that makes sense to me yeah. for sure for yeah sure. so nobody nobody is even checking temperatures and 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 but you see it yeah, you see it. If if Katie is coming over to play with little Jackie every day, having play dates, and then one day you Katie has stopped showing up, or Jackie is saying Katie's being mean to her now. Mm -hmm. Temperature check. Maybe Katie got something else going on at the house, or something happened, mm -hmm. and she she does she's not going to initiate that conversation. Does that make sense? It does. I feel like a lot of people just turn a blind eye or they don't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame. Late, you're, you're human. You're supposed to be involved. Right. It's, it's, it's our responsibility. Yeah. People say, oh, no, they don't have anything. Yes, it does. Because if you, if, if, if a person say it doesn't have anything to do with them, if a kid is walking around like that, and whatever community they come from. But if somebody was out there ciphering gas out of somebody's car, you get 99 people calling the police on that gas because yep. somebody stole the gas out their car. Mm -hmm. But you see a kid, somebody walking around, that is that all it takes is a conversation, and especially those who they are have been around because they've seen it. Right. And they don't have that conversation. That could be the same person going to your somebody else's neighborhood mm -hmm. and cipher gas. So that was your part of your community. Why are you just didn't ask them some questions? Right. If they say it takes a village, that's the freaking truth. That's yeah. the truth. It does. I that. You know? So when 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 a person says, How you doing? Don't just say it so you can get a oh I'm cool. No, say it because you really mean it because this is our responsibility because when it's the first time something happens, I guarantee you, not one person, these these police, these, these school shootings and all these different things, somebody saw something and said, that's not my business. Yes. Don't you feel like every time something like that happens, I feel like on the news, there's always one or two people that said, 
yeah, I kind of knew this was going to happen or I knew he was a little off. Yes. And they, and oh, he, oh, we live next door. We used to hang out together, you know, and, and I don't know. We just stopped. Why? Right. Like, why? What you happened? know, I feel like it's our duty because we, you know, we're responsible. We are responsible for humankind, period. Now, am I saying everybody needs to go? Everybody that lives in, in Wisconsin need to come down and, and help the people in Compton. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. Manage where you live. Right. Your block, them kids that used to play with your kids, your friends, children. You know, back in the day, if I messed up at school, if I messed up down the street, guess what? I got a paddling at school or I got one down the street and they're calling my mother and telling my mother what I did. Right. But now this is so different. People are, are not even allowing uh, parenting to come into play. What they're doing is they're giving their kids this and say, here, go play. Yeah. That's the babysitter. That's the new That's the babysitter. You know. And this is this is what becomes the first part of food poisoning because you've been exposed to to, to poisons because we don't know what's really going on. Right. And you know don't I mean? you feel like it. I feel like there's so many, so many things on there that are just desensitizing. Damaging. Yeah. Very damaging. Yes. You know. Absolutely. Can did you have any history with um, being in the juvenile system? No. Okay. okay, my first my first arrest. You, I told you. I, I mean, I'm not gonna say my first arrest. I'm gonna say, yeah. Excuse me. This was my very first arrest. Okay. Now, mind you, prior to this, I I had been uh, jacked by the police. That's what we call it. Mm -hmm. Dropped off in different neighborhoods, taking my money, you know, and whatever. The first time I was I was arrested was um, someone had. Um, someone I knew was supposed to have been buying drugs from me. I showed them to him in the car and they drove off well, before they paid me. So the next time I seen him, I got in the car and I, I took what I felt like they was owned, you know, owed to me at that particular time. And then they came back to the police. So I was arrested. Uh, the, the charges was dropped. So, and I was 19 years old. So from 19, I just started getting arrested a lot, getting detained, I'll say, getting detained, not with, not uh, where I was getting uh, found guilty and all like that, but it just, my, I was, my police record started getting padded okay. from the time I was 19. Never got, never been uh, in handcuffs or, well, I got handcuffed before in high school, but I never was take it to the police station until after 19. So um, that I uh, I went to prison uh, for, they gave me 16 months for drug uh, drug possession for sale. And I did 11 months, came home. I was, uh, that was in 84, mm -hmm. so I was 20. And uh, the next time was, I was, 24 and the same system that never asked me was okay the same ones that was arrested me the same ones that sent me out there to um defend myself protect myself to serve myself um sentenced me to two years i mean excuse me 11 years four months and two life sentences when i was 24 years old but aiding and abetting attempted murder um so I was basically thrown away. Um, I was disposable. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not, um, I was not bidding, benefiting what, to society as they felt that I could, but you guys never gave me a freaking chance. You never, you never gave me, and, and, and this is not an excuse, it's not. Mm -hmm. What I am saying is this. When someone looks up, by when I was a kid, I wanted to be a police officer. The, the Cagney and Lacey and all that, that it was just, cause I was very athletic. I liked to run and all. I didn't see the police in a bad light at that time. Mm -hmm. 
I'm saying when I was eight, nine, ten, what you want to be this. And um, when the, the steps that I went through, the things that I went through, the traumatic experiences that I went through, just being a young black uh, non-conforming mm -hmm. woman, I felt like I was never heard. I was, my words were only used to lock up someone who looked like me, but had a, you know, had a different genitalia. Right. No, they never gave me an opportunity to pursue what life was like because I was too busy trying to fight to make sure that this didn't happen to me no more because y'all weren't helping me. Right. Makes sense? Like, yeah. like so, you were in a constant state of fight mode. Every, every day. Every day. Because I feel like if somebody found out, if somebody found out that this 15-year-old got away with this, mm -hmm. what this 19-year-old going to try to do? What is this 22-year-old do? What about that, that, that friend's uncle that I seen looking at me weird? Mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, uh, things like that, because, you mm -hmm. know, I, just, I, I feel like I, I was shortchanged, man. I was just, you know, I thought that that's what they have psychology. They got all these different people, all these different departments, all these different. I know they got some people that talk to kids, psychologists. They got social workers. They got this, they got this, they got this. They got, but I guess they don't come on this side of Compton Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would think there, I mean, there's a victim advocacy, you know, for children that have been through trauma, that should have all been set in place. Yeah. I bet Cindy Brady would have got it. I bet she would have. Yeah. It had to be completely, I, I'm just trying to imagine mentally and emotionally exhausting being in that fight mode every day of your life. It was, it was, um, it was like, um, <laughs> All right, April, get up, go, get up, ready for school. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. I got my, I got my, my notebook. I got my ink pen. I got my coloring book. Okay, and I got my uh, tweezers. So just in case if somebody tried to do something to me. Yeah. Dang, wait. Let me go back in. Let me make sure I got my keys because I was showed how to put the keys between your fingers. So if you mm -hmm. can, you know. So every day I like I had to just like a. <laughs> I was, I was a, a street law enforcement, street law enforcer, because every day I had to pack my weapon, whatever it may be, whether it's a, a, a number two pencil or mm -hmm. something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Mm. That's, 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 yeah. That's, that was my life. So. Um, mm. Going into your, you know, that prison sentence, uh, when you mentioned the time, what was that sentence again? 11 years, four months, plus two life sentences running concurrent. Okay. Wait, for aiding and abetting attempted murder. Okay. But <laughs> I was, um, I was continuously called Mr. Atkins by the district attorney. They got three objections from my attorney. I was, they kept saying I would live with a lesbian, you know, I was lesbian. That was their focus point. I received more time than the actual shooter. Are you kidding me? No, I received more time than the actual. I got found guilty of attempted murder of two people mm -hmm. while they said I stayed in the car. The person that was where they said, that's him. He got assault with a deadly weapon and did not get a life sentence for it. That's insanity. <laughs> it was, it was, it was because of me, my, my identity of such, mm -hmm. you know, period is that was it it was nothing to, 
how, like how. Right. So, yeah. And, and your attorney, when, you know, these things happened, like you said, you were, were referred to as Mr. Did they, uh, like you said, they objected, right? They tried to three correct. Three times. Three times they said it. Yeah. Three times. Yes. Mr. Atkins, objection, Your Honor. I'm sorry, Ms. Atkins. We're talking 89, 1989. People weren't just looking right. at me, my age out there. Yeah. The day that you had received that sentence, I can only imagine how that felt. Uh, did it hit you immediately or did it take a while to set in the heaviness of that? When I got found guilty, my mom was in the courtroom as well. Uh, when I got found guilty, because first of all, <laughs> I didn't even know how much time I was looking at. I swear. I had no idea how much time I was looking at. They never gave me no offers or anything. Because I'm thinking, okay, even if I get found guilty of something, I played such a minimal role. It right. should be okay. Yeah. Uh, when they found me guilty, because I asked my attorney, when the jury was in deliberation, I said, um, how much time is this? You know, he said that could be life. I said, what? You know, for what? Like, for what? Mm -hmm. You know, no one died or anything. Not minimizing, but no one died in my case, right? And I'm like, office said I was found guilty. Mm -hmm. I said, in court, I said, does that mean I'm going to get life? This was why they was reading the deliberation, reading the, the uh, verdict. I had no idea. Um, and then they, they, and they, I don't even know, cause my trial was so quick, you know, I, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was a couple of days later or not, cause it was kind of blurred out, but I remember my mom just in the back crying, like, you know, um, and I had a fight the same day I got sentenced because somebody was in a, in, in a whole tank talk about they had, they just got 90 days and it was only their third prostitution. It was something like that. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I went, I, I hit him. And um, yeah, it was just, well, I, was, I was still caught up. It was it's still a blur of exactly what happened, you know? Yeah, yeah I bet. Okay. And where is the first uh, prison you landed at? I see a, a California Institution for Women. Okay. Uh, yeah, I went there and I was in receiving. They had open uh, CCWF up north, the Chachala. Yeah. wasn't open yet when um, I when I came. So I was in receiving and I was going to be the first unclassified lifer to go there, to go up there. And I knew that was far. And my mom was one. My mother's always been dedicated to my life. And my mother was like, no, you can't go up there. So my mother started putting in her hardships and everything. And they, um, they, prolonged me and put me on the main yard. Then from the main yard, they sent me up there. And um, I I basically ended up coming back in about two months because she had already did her hardship and everything. But I had a fight while I was up there and they kept me in, in uh, lockup until I came back. Okay. I'm sure it's different in a woman's prison than men's prison, but what was your experience? When, were you greeted by any friendly faces or was it sort of a tense off top? Okay. Um, I'm going to take you back to my whole jail, my whole. Um, yeah. So my incarcerated experiences were, I remember I told you I was, I went to jail, you know, I would do little stints uh, where I went, but no foul, no charges, whatever. So, right. um, so I started making a name for myself in a sense. People knew me in the system. Uh, when I end up going for this case, excuse me. When I end up going for this case, and I went to the county jail, mm -hmm. um, I was approached um, by a sheriff uh, who um, made advances towards me, a female made advances towards me. So I had a, a, a relationship in, in the jail with a sheriff. Um, 
which uh, I felt like I was the one that was in control of all of that um, until um, I would see that if it was other people I talked to, they would manipulate me and make me feel bad. And um, I started feeling like if I didn't, it was like the best way I could describe it. Mm -hmm. Like Terry Crews, when he said he was touched by a man, everybody's like, what the hell you mean? You got all these muscles. You're too masculine for a man to take advantage of you. It must be some BS. Right. I remember that. I remember that. And so how they how they how people accepted that. Yeah. So just imagine me. I'm very aggressive, very masculine. I'm in jail in, in the jailhouse. There's some sweet, innocent academy graduate squeaky clean as police it had to be my fault right so uh because you're you're the masculine one you could have just said no you could have just did whatever but it, like in silver brand if you if you even get caught flirting with somebody mm -hmm. they tell them you go to lock up so just say the tables is turned. Somebody flirt with you. What do you do? You either way you can go to. So you buy into it, right? So I yeah. bought into it. So everybody thought I had it going on, mm -hmm. but I was in a relationship with somebody who held the keys to my freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom even meaning walking the halls of a jail. I could have went to lockup or whatever. But I didn't see it as such. I just seen it like I must be the one that's winning because I'm getting candy from time to time. So, mm -hmm. But I'm being pulled out late at night to have relations with somebody, you know. Um, went from there, went to CIW. And over there, it's like when they see it's a bus coming, the women come line themselves up and it's just like it's a picking like how you said, like at Shawshank Redemption, fresh fish were reeling them in. Yes, I remember that part. It's like that. And, you know, the, the, the aggressives, the ones who look aggressive, be out there picking the, the cute little pretty girls. And, and the other ones, they come and they pick the masculine ones with gifts, mm -hmm. you know, here. And so I told you I did 11 months already. So I was already here, you know, here, here, you know that kind of things. But then it switched from inmates to staff. So I have been, um, I have been in a few unwanted, unwanted uh, masterships, I'll say, because they weren't relationships. Even though in my mind, just because I'm getting some, some colored tank tops and some different color socks mm -hmm. and food every now and then, I was not in control. Right. The person I was in the mastership with or the, the toxic, un, unapproved, mm -hmm. manipulated relationship with, mm -hmm. all they had to say is, hey, that girl that looked like a dude, look what she did to me. So we're talking several people, you know, and, and I just started talking about this because um, it was brought to my attention one time. It was like, uh, hey, but why you don't talk about all the relationships you have with them different staff? Mm -hmm. I was like, why? Well, like, you know, you know, it was what? It was like, there are no consensual relationships in prison with staff. No. There no. are no consensual relationships with staff. So them times when I was walking and, and um, I get two officers run up on me to come search me and one of them is her because I don't want to talk to her and I'm walking with another girl. That's Things like that happening. Yeah. You know, or... Um, you got these men that are looking at me or saying I'm a predator, like I'm that one that's like 
because they're they they feel challenged by my identity. Yeah. It's just it it it's you know when you I guess when you are in a storm and somebody hang you an umbrella, mm-hmm. even though that umbrella is somebody else's or you shouldn't take it. Sometimes I think you, you just grab it because you're just in that storm and you just want to feel like something is kind of normal. Absolutely. And they, they made me feel like something was kind of normal, but at any given time, they could snatch that umbrella and make me soak and wet, leave me out in the, in the pouring rain. Right. You know what I mean? And, uh, and say, it was, hey, she stole my umbrella. Uh, yeah. I know a lot of people may not understand what I'm saying. They may not, <laughs> you know, cause it sounds crazy. The first time I talked about this, I was like, I was so, I felt torn. I felt embarrassed because how, how is it that somebody, an aggressive, a stud gonna say that they felt manipulated by a girl, like a, a woman, you know, because she's the chief deputy warden because she's a program director, right. because she's an associate warden, because she's a CEO, because she's a sergeant, she's a lieutenant. That's, you know, and you eating, you eating good and you got cell phones and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if I don't act right, guess what happens? Mm-hmm. If I don't do what they want me to do, guess what happens? Let me not make that phone call. Let me, let me scorn her. Let me, let me, let her see me some, with somebody else that is, that is, as, as common as me in here that's wearing the same thing, got the same kind of identification, let her see me with something like that and guess what's going to happen to me. So how is that a moment of I'm in control? I'm not. Right. That sounds like one of the most, to me, hearing this from you, one of the most severe forms of um, mental manipulation and abuse. I never saw it like that until, you know, and then because I always felt like I, would, I was able to talk my way out of, shit, you know, go, come with me, what you tripping on, you know, all that. Mm-hmm. But now that I see life, I was, I've been, I've been, I've been used like my whole life. I have never been in a healthy relationship in my whole entire life. But I've been in several relationships. Yeah. I feel like also uh, what you said, people assume things by looking at us, right? Right. They, they might not have assumed that that, you know, warden or deputy or CO, just by the based off of how she looked, wasn't uh, a predator or, but really they, she was preying on you. Right. She knew that any time she could say any accusation and, you know, get you in further trouble or she knew what she was doing. These people know what they're doing and they have used those that power. Right. And, you know, and and, and I was so in the, in the prison system when I was in the prison system. I, you know, I'm going to say I was in top five well-known people in the whole California prison system of women, period. Top five. I was, I was always performing, you know, even though we were prison, you know, at one point in time was everywhere on clothes. And, and I'm just saying all that to say, I think that they felt like I was closest to the street as looking maybe they could not pursue that when it was on the street they maybe felt like they was inadequate yeah for us to have that type of relationship on the street so right. why not go where they feel above and they can have somebody who's more submissive to their um their desires right yeah yeah that makes sense was there ever any you know anyone that you were incarcerated with that pointed things out to you like you know the relate as far as that relationship like warning you like hey she shouldn't do you like that or 
was it just seen as i don't know how's it viewed by other incarcerated people i guess is what i'm saying um well i you know i had a couple of friends that um that knew like and they was benefiting like i eat shrimp they eat shrimp okay so hey go ask her for this that type of stuff right mm -hmm. but the girls that i did deal with as um you know, we were jobs dating. They'd be like, you know, she treated me all messed up or why she like you, you know, that kind of, I'm like, no, you know, she don't, you know, I have to play that part. Right. But yeah, so I'll say when they would say that, I felt like, girl, you're just trying to knock me from getting some chicken, <laughs> yeah. you know, in yeah. a sense like that. Mm -hmm. um, but one of my friends told me since I've been home, why you don't talk about that? Cause she knew she knew the things like without me having the real full conversations about everything, but we did so much time together. She knew like I was um, like a, a lot of the staff were like liking me, yeah. you know, and uh, yeah, it was. Mm. So as I said, I just started, I, the first time I had a conversation about it was at the UN. I spoke at the UN two weeks ago, three weeks yeah. ago. Tell me a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Um, they were, um, my friend mm -hmm. contacted me and said, uh, um, hey, uh, somebody from the UN, the attorney from the UN wants to, and she asked me about, did I know anybody who had been incarcerated, who'd been in lockup while they're in prison, you know, and uh, you have a story, Do you have anybody? And she said, yeah. And she contacted me and she said, tell them. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time it ever came out of my mouth. Cause I always, and I, like I said, I felt like you feel like a punk. You feel like people look at you like, and you just uh, what is wrong with you? You was, you wasn't saying that when they was up in there bringing you them phones. You wasn't up in there, but it still contributed to my toxic relationships. It, it it contributed to the fact that I have I was I was I was used, man. Like I had I was in a. Uh, a wanted, unwanted power trip. Uh, it was Stockholm. Yes. Stockholm. That's what that is. That's the best way. Yeah. I was in them. I was in relationships like that. So I'm still, um, I'm trying to build a resume of who April really is. Okay. You know, if, if if I put, if I were to put all the things on my resume that were pretend or fake or not, were consensual, mm -hmm. were in a good space, I would, my resume would just have started. Wow. Even though I live this, I live this much life, right. um, this much that I lived. Yeah. <laughs> I have this much life, but only this much that I have lived. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're, yeah. Do you feel like you're able to now look at people and maybe see some of those red flags? Maybe they're toxic. And do you feel like you're able to spot that a little more easily? Am I able to spot when people are more toxic now? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, uh, yeah, I believe so. I believe, I believe so. You know, I, I see a therapist now. I was I've been seeing a therapist since I've been home. Okay. And uh, you know, I always tell it. I, I I when she asked me, why do you want to see a therapist? Mm -hmm. I said, because I want to know that when I see that sky and it's and it's blue, and I'm telling other people it's blue and everybody else around me is saying no, it's green, I need to know that I'm not tripping. Yes. That I'm not a weirdo. I that feel. just because because my the, the the what what would be said is 
<clears throat> that's because you've been gone a long time. Because if you look at it this way, it's really green. You know, and I'm good. I am good with uh, criticism. Tell me. I need to learn. It's a lot that I just don't know. You know, the, 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 um, the child inside of those who have been locked up, mm -hmm. the clock of maturity of that child stops. We can gain a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom of different things. Like I can read people like, no, no, I, I, I know how to insight, mm -hmm. causative factors, therapy, uh, talking to people about what it really means to really go inside and really understand the insides of what makes people do these different things. I can, I, I know that I can give that. Um, why am I afraid of the fog? Why, how is it that you, um, how do you really, uh, compromise in a relationship without being manipulated? Mm -hmm. Those are things that I'm still learning. Yeah. So like I said, I got a lot of life, but just, just this much that I have lived. Mm -hmm. I, I came home, like I put myself in a, and when I came home, I put myself in bankruptcy. Uh, I'll say bankruptcy as far as not 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 to that extreme that word, but I'll say I put myself in debt physically, uh, socially, um, financially. Mm -hmm. I felt like I owed everybody because mm -hmm. of the life that I live where I I drained them. So I I felt like every day I have to I have to go big or go home. Like um I know this is like my my first relationship since I've been home. Mm -hmm. I've only been in two relationships since I've been home. I mean, not only, but two relationships. Yeah. And they both were people that I felt like I harmed before because I did not know how to be in a relationship, mm -hmm. both behind the walls. So I was in these relationships and being that I did not treat them the way that I felt like I should have been treated them. So I owe them a relationship. So I became in a relationship with them but they weren't wanting me with me because it felt like I just, I needed to pay my debts, mm. you know, because I owed um, financially. Mm -hmm. I, I owed everybody who ever sent me said hello or accepted a phone call. I bought TVs, I bought this, I bought this and this and this. And this. Now that all the smoke is clear, I'm sitting up trying to figure out how do, how do you live from check? check the check. Damn, where am I going to get my rent from this month? Oh my God. You know, let me go and try to sell something. Mm -hmm. Because I felt like my life was such in an amends that if I don't go as big mm -hmm. and show gratitude and in the depth of what could be really seen, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not living there. That means that I made a promise to myself that I would do it. My mm -hmm. God, I... Yeah. It sounds like that, almost like the heaviness of that guilt just eats you up and you go above and beyond to sort of, I don't know. I, I just, I feel what you're saying, but I'm like, you're worth so much more than that, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are. Yeah. It's just trying to trying to find that, trying to yeah. find that that uh, you know I, I'm finally at that place where I'm saying you know what, it's my turn. Yeah, it's my turn. Yeah. You know, but me saying that I still have to um have to clean house and I never I never stored no nuts for my future. Right. 
Right. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'll be 59. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just started working, uh, you know, I don't, in the last 53 years, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, I just started working. And so I am trying to, you know, I always say this, I'm, I'm not, I'm not lying on my belly anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm just on my knees. I'm just trying to get to my feet. That's it, you know? And I'm just not in that state of mind where I I see that. Right. Yeah, right, right. So in total, um, how much time did you serve before you were able to parole? And how did that happen? Uh, okay, I did 27 years, six months, and four days. Um, what happened was I had, um, I had to go to the parole board. Mm -hmm. I went to parole board nine times. Um, you have to get found suitable. Um, you have to, in order for a person to come home, Mm -hmm. you have to go to the board and I'm i I'm gonna put it in, in the, as gritty as possible. Okay. You have to go in there and tell them how much of a piece of shit you were before you went to jail. Mm -hmm. How the prison system saved your life and rehabilitated you to the fact that you are good enough to go home, massa. And when I go home, I'm going to be a good girl. They need to be able to see that you wasn't shit before you got to them. And that's what gets through to the and board. that R, that R at the end of that CDC, yeah. that R helped you. Helped you become a citizen, somebody who we can put on the streets and give them a job that they can with no good livable wages. Or, no, I ain't going to say give them a job. They, they put you in a position where you get out and now you go fend for yourself. Figure it out. Because we ain't got nothing for you, even though we got all these different programs and different stuff. But what we're going to do, we're going to give you 40,000 different consequence, uh, uh, collateral consequences because you are an uh, ex-felon. Uh, you have been in prison, so you can't get this job. You can't get a house nowhere. You can't go live nowhere because your record is all screwed up. You you know, you can't apply for this. You can't get a life. You can't become a real estate agent because if you have sold drugs your whole life, you are good at selling. Mm-hmm. So why not transfer them skills and become like a real estate agent or something? But you can't because collateral consequences. You can't get past that. That's that. Uh, you can't get licensed for that. So you can't go. You can't even go sell some freaking used cars because you got you can't pass that license. Mm-hmm. So it's all these different things. But what we're gonna do? Hey, you're free. Yeah. Go figure it out for yourself. That's basically what it. So, because you followed, you followed the formula that that R of CDC gave you, and you have become suitable enough for us to say, "Hey, you can go home. Now go home and make it happen." And if it wasn't really and truly, if it wasn't for the communities that I told you about, the ones that are basically helping raise this vi- these children in these villages or these returning people uh, formerly incarcerated that are returning home. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't for these nonprofits and these people that these abolitionists, these prison reform programs, these different uh, organizations like that or people who have just a heart to say, you know what, I'm gonna help you get on your feet. You know, here's something or here we can rent, we'll rent this out to you or we'll, whatever. If it wasn't for them, the system fails. It, it, it fails. The system has felt as our communities are the ones who have helped us, period. Right. Right. Yes. Crazy. It's like, uh, you know, like you said, they give you a pat on the back. Okay, you're free, you're out. But there's no safety net. But, uh, you know, the nonprofits in the community, thank God for that. I mean, what do you think are like the top five most important things that somebody coming out of, of prison 
needs support with? What what can we as a community help um, support? Like, you know, obviously, like, I'm sure employment, housing. What do you feel top five? Yeah. Um, number one is housing. Uh, employment, for sure. Benefits, some type of financial, whatever, because right. clothing, you have people that's been locked up a long time that just don't know, like even a life skills coach. Yes. Somebody, life skills coach, because we don't know how to dress. We don't know what's in. You know, we, we have these different things that's going on inside of us, even if we have somebody that's a mentor that is just there for them. them that five o'clock in the morning call that I had to give Facebook because I was in the fog trying to dry to work and I've got petrified. I went on Facebook live. I didn't have anybody else to call. I was scared yeah. to death. So that person, the people that you can call food, um, being free to eat whatever you want to eat. That is a big thing. Just, you know, where you will be able to um, not worry about where your next meal may come from. Mm -hmm. um, and the other would be help with, Everything from how to use a phone to helping me get my birth certificate, my driver's license, my ID, social security card, okay. that type of thing. You know what I mean? Them, yeah. are, them are the like some of the main things. When I when I first came home, I went into um, into transition housing, and I became a staff at the transition housing, and okay. I was so blessed to be able to assist people. With, with them things that are, you know, that are very much needed in order to progress in life, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's good because obviously you went through it yourself. So who better to help others, you know, get yes. through those things? Right. Right. Interested in helping to back um, some nonprofits that are going to help people transition back into the free world. And I think that's obviously super important um yes to be successful yeah absolutely so what are things looking like for you right now as far as um in your everyday life are you, you know you employed right now are you working with the, i mean i think you're doing some things if you want to share that you're uh, paying it forward sort of with the people that are incarcerated still right or in the yes. community Yes. Um, right now, I work for an organization called Success Stories, mm -hmm. where we get uh, people to focus on what they say are really important to them. We focus on the top five people, um, achievements, goals, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, and you live it in integrity to show that them things are important to you. Um, I go back inside of CCWF. I go inside CIW. I go, I facilitate at, at a Homeboy Industry. I facilitate at Van Nuys High School. I am the only cis woman that work for this organization. So any, uh, this information that's coming out, that's, that's being uh, the curriculum that is being delivered is only by myself as far as females go. Um, so I travel, I travel a lot going up north and different things like that. I'm driving all these different places. Um, I love it. You know, I'm, I'm able to um, let them see success. When I say success, I'm saying internally, I'm, I'm able to let them see what internal success look like when you're, you know, living in integrity. Even though oftentimes it, it can be kind of, it could be rough. It could be uh, uh, challenging from time to time. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really um, living that. I also, um, I, I let them recognize what internalized toxic masculinity looks like and how we buy into it and how do we portray it as women, how do we promote it and uh, how we can change our communities, how we can change families one, one person at a time with just uh, challenging different beliefs, you know, and, and uh, seeing what, uh, you know, rich thinking look like as far as success on the inside. Um, 
I have been to uh, quite a few different places speaking, uh, doing speaking engagements. Um, and um, I, um, what else? I've been to, uh, I, I go, every year I go to this, um, this conference called Beyond the Bars mm -hmm. out in New York, where different people are coming from all over the nation. Uh, we're just brainstorming on how to abolish prisons, how to abolish systems, you know, abolish patriarchy, uh, you know, and, and uh, live in our own accountability and see what that looked like. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm at, at this present, I am, uh, I am looking to um, try to um, get my own place, uh, you know, and uh, start living that life that I told you about, yes. getting it from here to where I know I am uh, worthy to be, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 this work is a is is hard work. It's it's big hard work, you know. And um, so the dedication of it all is 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 a beautiful thing. I'm I'm loving it. I wouldn't. I, I'm loving it. Um, you know, often time you have to get something else in order to uh, survive in in different ways. Um, but. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm out here. I'm just, I'm trying to give back as much as I can and be of service as much as I can, you know? Right. You're paying it for definitely by doing those things, helping out, you know, devoting your time, your knowledge. Do you feel like it helps you as well by, by doing these things? Yes. Um, I don't want this to sound like cliche or none of that kind of stuff, but it's like some of the words that come out of my mouth that get filtered in are for me to hear. Right. Okay. You know, yeah. and I think that when I'm when I'm in, and also, I every time I facilitate, I learn something from the participants. Mm -hmm. Something else that I can uh, put in my toolbox, in a sense, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. If you could just give a brief summary of uh, mentioned toxic masculinity, there are some people that might not even realize what that is, or they might be questioning, you know, you know, how does that relate to, to prison? Can you let them know? Right. Okay. Well, toxic masculinity is what... patriarchy, what the definition of a real man is to those who define men as uh, 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 as a power, in a sense. Okay. Money, having a lot of women, mm -hmm. um, violence, you know, them things, like, if you're not, a, if if men supposed to do certain things, that's mm -hmm. what toxic, you're not supposed to cry, you're supposed to be emotionless, uh, fight any battles, you don't walk away, you have a lot of money, have a lot of women, this kind of thing. If you're not these things that, that society, majority of people in society say that you're not, you must be this, you're not man enough. Yeah. Okay. You know, I've often asked people, like, what is a real man to you? He's supposed to protect. He's supposed to be the one that's, uh, that's providing. He's supposed to do this. He's supposed to do this. He's supposed to do that. So if he's supposed to do these things, if he's not doing them things, he's not a man. So what if you have a man that was in a car accident and he's not able to do them things? Does that make him less than a man? Mm -hmm. If you are a UFC fighter, you're a female, you're a UFC fighter, your man is a chef, and somebody comes and approach you guys, who's better fit for that situation? Does that make him less than a man because he's a surgeon, his hands, whatever, and you have, that is what you do for a living, you are a UFC fighter. Does that make him less than a man? Mm -hmm. Because your man cries. Your man can show emotions. Does that make him less than a man? So what we do when I say we as women, 
how we internalize it and we buy into it, we often tell them, stop crying. You're a boy. You don't want to be white. You know, you're not supposed to cry. You know, toughen up. If somebody hits you, you better hit them back. You know, because if not, you're a man. Why would you be a cheerleader when you could be a football player, son? Mm -hmm. That's what sissies do. Sissies be cheerleaders. Men play football. Men play basketball. Men do these other things. But so we buy into that and we push that as well. So we're we're looking at people just being them whole their whole authentic selves. Why is that not enough? Yeah. Just imagine a world without the toxic part of the masculinity. Without the toxic part of it. Mm -hmm. Letting everybody breathe the way they breathe. You don't have to prove your manhood by being a gang member. You don't have to prove your manhood by being one who starts wars. You don't have to prove manhood by having a pissing contest. You don't have to prove you're a man be higher, having a whole lot of women, having a whole lot of children, and all these different things. That does not make you a man. Right. That's the toxic part. That's what often different coach communities say. That's a man. We're yeah. saying. We're saying that's, that's not true. Mm -hmm. And I like what you said about uh, how we as females even contribute to that by how we speak to our sons or, you know, our husbands or boyfriends or, you know, it, it plays a part. We, yeah. we, we challenge that. We challenge that. If, if, if we're challenging at home and, and there's, they're at home with us, we're challenging at home mm -hmm. and, how if, if the place he's supposed to feel safest yeah what happens out there in the streets that's right that's right how can people get a hold of you if they would like you to maybe uh, speak at their um, nonprofit or place of employment or different functions do you have social media um, my my facebook name i'm a writer uh, i'm a poet uh, I used to do spoken word and things like that. Um, my uh, my Facebook page is is B L E U B O. It's Blue Bow. My uh, my writing name is Blue Ink. B L E U I N K K. Okay. So okay, yes. Yeah, so I have Instagram. I have Facebook. I have um, TikTok. You, yeah, you can message me even all those, and I'll put them in the description of the video so people can follow you. Okay. Yeah. Sounds we'll great. I want to say, um, first of all, you know, no one, no one is bad. We all make choices that line up with the information that we had at that particular time. As I said, it becomes food poison. It can rotten us on the inside. Mm -hmm. You know, no one. We 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 believe in love without disposability. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, if we all, if each and every one of us reach out to one person, one person that we see that has disrupted their lives, we see that they their lives have changed in some sort of way, and we all become concerned instead of nosy. Mm -hmm. We can we can we can change some things up. We actually really can. Um, and and if we all kind of like look at ourselves as um, some of the traumas that we have been through, maybe maybe everybody haven't been sexually molested. Maybe you know they have endured some other type of traumas. Believe me, they show up in different ways. Yeah. And hurt people hurt people. So whatever ways they may show up. Just because somebody's not being physically harmed does, by whatever it is that you're doing to protect yourself does not mean that they're not being emotionally harmed. Um, I'm going to give you two examples right quick, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. I know someone, I, I have a friend. He's in his 50s. We're around the same age. He was about three years old when he remembered his mother and his father. His, uh, his father was abusing his mother. And that night, his father threw spaghetti, a plate of spaghetti, threw it on the wall. My man is 50 plus years old. To this day, he does not eat spaghetti. Mm -hmm. 
it harmed him. Yeah. So if he if the spaghetti is one part, what else is showing up? I had someone else say, well, they challenged what I said. I, I, I said, we're victims of victims who cause victims. Yeah. So this person said, well, that's an oxymoron. He said, because I was bullied in school my whole life, but I never hurt anyone, I said. Now, I know this person personally. I said, that's not true. You've cheated on your wife. You had to get divorced. You left your children. You work all the time. You don't think people are hurt? Just because blood does not shed does not mean you're not hurting anyone. So your traumas are still showing up, brother. You know? So let's just look at different things. And it takes fearless and moral inventory to search yourself. You have to fearlessly look at the things that that it took me 36 years. It took me 36 years after that night of eating pizza and Pepsi, 36 years to say, to come out of my mouth, I was raped. 36 years, from that night, 36 years later was the first time I said I was raped. And so I was able to con connect dots and figure out why was it that I was the person that I became and how do I change that? First and foremost, I have to speak it. I have to confront it. I have to talk about it. I have to get that food poison out in order for me to get some good, refreshing pureness, something supposed to be making my machine work better than to continue to clog it up and harm it. So I'm, I'm you know, that's what I do every chance I get now. So. I, like that. I like that, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And um, I feel like if people open themselves up and start looking at things in life through the lens that you sort of explained right now, right. we can really do a lot of great things. Thank you. Yeah, I thank you for your time, your knowledge, and sharing your, your life story and journey so far. It was a pleasure okay. to meet you. I know we, we touched on some some difficult things, but to see what you've been through and your positive nature and the way you're paying it forward um, is very inspiring. Thank you so much. I'm here for anybody if they um, at any 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 place. It ain't a mountain too high I won't climb. Right, right. Okay, so you guys I'm, heard that. Yeah, you can reach out, and hopefully, if you come up north. Sometime in the future, maybe we can connect and have lunch or coffee and get together. I'm there every I'm up there every Monday. Okay. I'm up there every Monday. So we can connect. We're gonna do that then. All right. All We're right. gonna send out you guys. Uh, remember, always keep your heart convicted. If you guys have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Have a blessed day.